My talk today is on life and death in the phytosphere, the, the plant um, environment, and basically the challenges faced by plant pathogenic bacteria. And really what I, I want to try and convey is that um, we often think about um, uh, bacteria in terms of model systems. So we think about bacteria interacting with plants and that's it. And what I want to try and do is just kind of give you a taste of, yes, they do interact with those, but they also interact with other um, systems outside of the plant. So my talk is going to be, is this um, plugged in? There we go. My talk is going to be broken down into three sections. I gather some of you don't work on this kind of um, part of biology, so I'm going to give a fairly longish introduction, maybe about 10 or 15 minutes, going through what these pseudomonas bacteria are that I work on, their life cycle, and some of the mechanisms of pathogenicity. We'll then move into what my group's been doing. So I'm a, a relatively uh, new lecturer in Reading. We've been, I've been going three years, and my, my PhD students working on this have been going just for a year and a half. So I'm going to try and keep it fairly um, shallow in terms of um, not hopefully lose you in terms of what we do, but we're going to talk about Pseudomonas, and in, the, in this particular case, a project we've been working on with a tree called Aeschylus. Um, I'll go through a little bit of genome sequencing work we've done, some pathogenicity studies, and then a little bit of ecology. And then just pull it all together in a summary. So Pseudomonas bacteria are pretty much ubiquitous in the environment. You'll find them pretty much everywhere. This is a slide that would, um, one of my friends has just pulled together Scott Godfrey for a, a review that we're doing on Pseudomonas, just really to try and demonstrate that um, Pseudomonas are found in many places on Earth, and they have, when we think of them in terms of um, bacteria, they've evolved basically a number of different lifestyles and interactions. We have um, Pseudomonas that interact with humans that are pathogenic, you often find them in the lung. We have Pseudomonas that are known for making many antibiotics. They're useful agents for controlling uh, pathogenic fungi and for controlling insects. They're also found in um, areas where they kind of colonize plant roots and they help plants to grow. And then we have also the plant pathogens. So I'm going to be talking to you today mainly about a Pseudomonas plant pathogen called Pseudomonas syringi. And basically this colonizes plants. You'll find it within the soil. It's also particularly seed-borne, so it's very commonly spread through contaminated seed. And through the process of a plant's life cycle, the Pseudomonas can basically occupy uh, most of the plant surfaces and, given the chance, try and infect into the plant and obtain the nutrients from there. If we think about Pseudomonas bacteria um, and their ability to survive in the environment in general, in the, in the plant environment we might break this down into two areas. One is the area around the roots that we call the rhizosphere. This is basically the roots and the soil. And the soil area is a fairly barren environment for a lot of bacteria. Uh, it's also packed with competitors and a lot of predators that will eat bacteria live in this environment such as nematodes and protozoa. The plant, though, offers um, a lot of nutrients. Uh, in some cases, they'll actually exude nutrients that attract bacteria like Pseudomonas onto roots. So here we have a seedling of uh, Arabidopsis placed onto a Petri dish with bacteria on there. And the Pseudomonas bacteria, you can see, strongly colonize the roots because of the nutrients exuded. If we look at the above parts of the plant, so what we call the phylosphere, then there are a lot of stresses that the pathogen has to overcome, whether they're abiotic stresses such as solar radiation or desiccation. We also have things like um, insects that feed on the plant and will inevitably ingest those bacteria, so they have to deal with those. So we can see here a little picture building up that the Pseudomonas bacteria have several different challenges um, before they even get into the inside of plants. Gaining entry into the, the plant host for Pseudomonas syringi, which is a, a, one of the, the kind of most well-studied plant pathogens, is a challenge in itself. 
And they will typically enter through stomata, so these um, organs on the plant leaves, and they'll go into the stomata to infect into the intercellular spaces. They can also infect through hydrothones, these small kind of channels that are on the edges of leaves. So the bacteria can get taken up during gutation when you get this water droplet formed. And when the water is sucked back into the plant leaf, it takes the bacteria with them. And the bacteria can also infect through wounding. So trichomes are like leaf hairs. If they get broken, then there's a hole created and bacteria can infect in there. Or any kind of damage to the plant through insect damage will also allow ingress. So if we consider um, a leaf surface, as we have here, or the outside of a root, then once a bacterium such as Pseudomonas syringae goes from that particular environment into the actual intercellular spaces of these um, uh, different parts of the plant, then there's a big change in that environment. And the bacterium senses that. It senses it through changes in the composition of the cells that it contacts. So different um, molecules expressed on these cells will actually trigger um, uh, changes in the, gene, in the gene expression of the bacterium. And also the chemical composition in here is much different to what we see on the outside. Things like the pH is much um, uh, different. The nutrient status is, is far different. You get a, a lot of different polysaccharides and amino acids that are present in these environments. And all of these taken together can act to change the gene expression profile of the plant pathogen. And in doing so, this is what then allows it to express virulence factors. And those virulence factors it would use to obviously gain nutrients. The outcome of this is that we see this um, symptomatically as a disease. Okay, so I've got two different kind of examples here. We have tomato and bean. And you can see we get various different pseudomonas bacteria and other bacteria that cause these symptoms on tomatoes, spots and specks, cankers. With um, the bean pathogen, this is um, causing, this is a healthy bean here. You can see a nice big root system, healthy leaves. The pathogen is kind of completely destroying the, the root system and the, and the leaf system here. So you get no development particularly well here. If it's kind of splashed onto mature leaves, then you get symptoms more like this. So like a water-soaked lesion and this kind of chlorotic halo around it as it's producing toxins. The pathogens can then also infect into fruits and into seed pods. And through doing so, you can then see how the bacteria come into contact with seeds. They can then get uh, envelop enveloped within the seeds and then when the seeds are dried, then the bacteria often will still be viable within those seeds and they can be propagated when the seeds are planted again. The final part, just to think about um, the life cycle of the, the, these pathogens. Once we've had infection occurring within the plants, we've seen how seeds can be, become infected, but also um, through um, severe infections, the bacteria will actually exude out of the plant tissue. So here we see um, the underside of a leaf, and you can see bacteria um, kind of exuding out. And if this is splashed with water, then that means that the bacteria can be disseminated within the environment. They can actually be disseminated into the atmosphere and be then um, travel, uh, they can travel for quite large distances. And also, of course, plant litter. Um, when the, the leaves are dropped or any kind of dead tissue falls, then this can also allow for um, dissemination of the, the pathogen in the environment. When we think about the actual plant-pathogen interaction and the pathogenicity mechanisms, um, basically we know that um, a lot of plants on Earth will have um, diseases of one form or another, but we have plants because they're generally resistant to um, most microbes. And one of the reasons why they're generally resistant is because they have immunity systems that can recognize many of these microbes. And the way that they're able to do that is that they've developed sensory systems that allow them to 
detect the presence of these bacteria. So even if they become infected, they can mount a defense response and basically stop it in its tracks. Now this is just showing you kind of a, a pictorial outline of a bacterial cell, and it expresses many different types of molecules. We have lipopolysaccharide, peptidoglycan in the cell wall, uh, this motility organ called a flagellum. All of these are very well known um, for triggering defense responses within plants. So basically what they do is they trigger what's known as basal resistance or what we now call PAMP triggered immunity, PTI. And PAMPs are pathogen associated molecular patterns. So lipopolysaccharides, peptidoglycan, flagellin, they all have a conserved molecular pattern that transcends of a wide variety of different bacteria. So when they come into contact with plants, they can trigger this basal resistance or PTI. And this leads to the plant cells strengthening their cell walls with this polysaccharide, callose, and they also produce lots of antimicrobials such as phytoalexins and reactive oxygen species. So this creates a problem then for anything that wants to become a pathogen or you know, it kind of infects a plant, how do you overcome this kind of basal resistance? Well, pathogens undergo evolution themselves, just like the uh, plants have developed their basal resistance, and they come up with systems to overcome that. So this is a diagram I'm going to use um, more that will get developed in the next few slides. This is just to show you um, basically the level of resistance of the plant from susceptible through to strong resistance. And if we have a non-pathogen, um, that then interacts with the plant and develops, I don't know, some toxins maybe that attack the plant, the plant then has to come up with a way of trying to stop its infection. And it comes up with this basal resistance. So it develops basal resistance. So you've got this PTI being expressed um, and that prevents the pathogen going any further. The pathogen then develops um, a new strategy. And in many of the plant pathogens like Pseudomonas syringae, they have acquired um, a system that we know as the type 3 protein secretion system. And what this does is it suppresses this basal defense and it allows the bacteria to grow inside the plant and cause disease. So it's basically acquired this set of genes here on, a, on what we call a pathogenicity island, which is basically a big chunk of DNA that's been acquired horizontally or um, laterally from some other um, microbe, and that allows it to form this structure here, this what we call a type 3 pilus. And this is a bacterial cell, and inside of the plants, they produce this pilus, and this pilus penetrates into the inside of plant cells. Once it does that, it starts secreting proteins through this pilus that we call effector proteins, and we can see a few of these effector proteins labelled on the outside here, they go into the plant cell and they're basically acting to target the plant defense systems. This is a really simple cartoon. I've used this for many years um, just basically to demonstrate this concept. So we have a bacterial cell inside of the plant tissue. It produces the pilus. It then transfers effector proteins through the plant cell wall and into the plant. Now, many plant biologists are starting to understand what these do. And what they do is they start targeting the sensors that see these things here and see the pilus and see the LPS and so forth. And they basically knock them out. Yeah? So they're, they're stopping the plant from seeing the pathogen. They also target things like trafficking. So they stop callos being deposited in the plant cell wall. And they also turn the plant's protein degradation system on itself it takes over that system to degrade proteins involved in the defense response. The thing is, though, the plants now are under quite strong selective pressure to come up with a new strategy to kind of stop this. So they've developed a new sensory system that sees these effector proteins. And these proteins here are called resistance proteins. And they see these effectors, and when they see them, it triggers another defense reaction. 
and it triggers a defense reaction that is commonly called effector triggered immunity or ETI. So basically the type 3 effectors that go into the plant cell are now being recognized by resistance proteins and this triggers off this defense reaction. If this happens we call this effector Historically, it's been called an avirulence protein because it's preventing virulence. Many um, pathogens have between 15 to 35 effectors. They do various different jobs, but this is partly driven by this kind of um, this effect where the, the um, plant is able to see the pathogen. And when you get this detection occurring between a resistance protein and effector, it triggers a new type of defense response which we see here. This is from 1961, I think it is, Zoltan Clement in uh, Hungary, very famous scientist who, who discovered this. This is a programmed cell death reaction. So it's not basal resistance, it's completely different. We get what we call a hypersensitive response. All the plant cells in this area suicide and they basically restrict the pathogen to that area of the plant. If you can't go anywhere, you can't spread within the plant, you can't gain nutrients, and eventually you die out. So we've seen this developing, where we've got PTI, evolution of the type 3 system, and then basically the plant then detects some of the effectors coming through this system and triggers this strong resistance response that we know as ETI, or the hypersensitive response HR. This puts back the pressure on the pathogen to come up with a new strategy. And what it does is, it basically um, triggers the, the production of many different effectors. And some of these effectors are recognised by plants. And this is the basis for host specificity between pathogens and their hosts. Okay, so um, it was originally found in flax and melampsera, um, a fungal plant pathogen system. This is just an example of bean with a pseudomonas pathogen. And basically, if you have an effector that is recognized by a resistance gene, you get this resistant reaction. Okay, and it's a dominant reaction. You have to have a, a dominant resistance gene and this effector. Any other combination, the pathogen goes unnoticed and it can cause disease. So it's the basis of host specificity. And so you end up in what we call a co-evolutionary arms race. We have the type 3 system has become involved in suppressing this, but then we get ETI occurring, so the pathogen has to develop a new system to stop this happening. So it produces, or rather it evolves, new effectors. And these effectors not only target these, but they target the systems involved here. So they target the resistance proteins and the MAC kinase cascade and the caspases that are involved in the defense response. They target a wide variety of systems. So this obviously then drives the plant and the pathogen into this arms race. And so you get this build-up of effectors um, within the plant pathogen. In the context of plant pathology, and this, I, I can tell you that this also happens in animal pathogens, insect pathogens, it also happens in, sim in some symbionts. It basically builds up the, the whole, the whole um, effector complement, so you've got a very complex host pathogen interaction. And it means that if you're going to become, if you're a pathogen infecting new hosts, then sometimes it's just a single quantum leap of one effector um, mutating or one effector being acquired that allows the pathogen to go on and infect a new host. So I'm going to summarise this first part. That's the end of the introduction. We've talked about um, biotic and abiotic challenges on environmental survival. We've looked at how um, plant pathogens have this challenge of overcoming the plant immune response. If it can survive both those challenges, then the outcome is that it can go on to infect plants and that leads to effectively un unstoppable growth and we have proliferation within that environment. On to the, the research part now and what I'm going to talk to you today is 
about a problem that is emerging in the UK. And this is a, a, a tree pathogen problem that we're talking about, but it has a lot of parallels for whatever plant systems um, that we use in general. But it's because it's a fairly new problem, because um, it's also a rapidly spreading problem, it's a very unique kind of opportunity in Britain particularly to kind of take on this, um, this kind of area. And Aeschylus is a tree um, uh, called Aeschylus hippocosanum, is the European horse chestnut, and it's planted all over Britain. And it's particularly prevalent in um, a lot of historical parks where it forms these kind of avenues. Um, it's also a very commonly planted uh, amenity tree, so it's used in um, public spaces to create shade and structure. So it's a very common tree, so, and it's very much <coughs> in the public eye. And these trees are, are not only just um, kind of regarded in, in terms of the, the kind of cultural aspect, but they're also very important because um, I gather we have some people from the Balkans in here. These trees came from there, but they've been in Britain from, for 500 years. So there's been a lot of time for the um, animals and insects and, and so forth to kind of develop with these trees. So they're very important in terms of some of the things that they provide. Uh, for example, the nuts on these, what we call conkers in England, um, are very important. They're used for feeding deer and so forth. There's over half a million of these trees in Britain, so they're pretty much um, all over the country. And they have properties that are useful in different industrial um, <coughs> circumstances. The woods used for um, uh, fruit industry. And then also there's a compound produced from this called esculin, which has got um, anti-inflammatory properties. And in fact, we also have a product in the UK, which is kind of like a shower gel, a, a kind of a bath gel, which is using prop, um, some extracts of this horse chestnut. The problem we have in Britain at the moment, so it's in, also in Belgium, it's also in the Netherlands, northern Germany and northern France, is that we have this new disease that's emerging, which is this bleeding canker. Okay, and you can see quite clearly this big, big kind of lesions all over the tree trunk. And this disease emerged in 2002, found first in, in Britain in southeast England, but it's within four or five years, it had spread all the way up to Scotland. So it's a newly emerging disease, and it spreads rapidly. So it kind of... It, opens up a lot of questions as to what, what's going on, how it's able to do that. A survey a couple of years ago showed that now we're in big trouble. We have about 50% of trees in the country are infected, and being that it's in the public eye, um, everybody sees these. A lot of trees um, have to be cut down because of this problem. Then, you know, it's very popular in terms of um, the country. The causal agent of this disease is a bacterium called Pseudomonas syringi pathovar esculi. And this particular pathogen is related to one that was found back in the 1960s in India, and it causes these specks here in the leaves. So the Indian pathogen was found on a different species of Aeschylus, Aeschylus indica, that causes specks in the lesions, but it, uh, it causes specks in the leaves but you don't see any symptoms in the trunk. And in fact, it's not actually regarded as a major problem. So we have a strain here, which we know um, was based in India, and then we also have um, what we call this kind of strain, just for shorthand, the Indian isolate, Indian PAE isolate. And then we have a bunch of strains um, that we've isolated in Britain which we call the European, or English, whichever way you want to think about it, um, isolates of PAE. Have these come from this strain, or has there been something intermediate? We don't know anything about that. What we do know, though, is that basically this seems to have no effect on this plant, and this doesn't seem to cause any disease in leaves of this plant. We do know, though, that the symptoms are much more dangerous with this pathogen here. This one will actually kill the tree. As far as we're aware, this one just won't have any major impact. So you have a huge kind of step up in virulence with 
this pathogen compared to this one. So the questions that arise from this, how is this related to this? How has this emerged so suddenly to kind of cause such a big problem? How does it overcome this particular species of Aeschylus in order to cause disease? And then also, how is it spreading throughout the population so quickly? Is there an element of survival in the, in the environment or interaction with other organisms that's helping it to spread? So these are some of the questions I'm now going to kind of move on to. The first thing we did was, um, in collaboration with David Studholm um, and Sophie Kamoon and the Sainsbury Lab and Sarah Green and Forest Research, was to sequence the genomes of the Indian isolate and three different isolates of the European strain. When we looked at the relatedness of these bacteria compared to other Pseudomonas syringi pathovars, so other pathogenic varieties, we, we found that the Aeschylus pathogen, the Aeschylus pathogen, is very closely related to other tree pathogens. This is the cherry pathogen, this is the olive pathogen, Savasinoi. So there seems to be some relationship with <coughs> other pathogens of woody hosts. When we get into the nitty-gritty of the genome itself, when we compare the Indian and the European pathogens, we look at the chromosome quite remarkably, even though they're at the phylogenetic level, if essentially identical, at the genomic level, we found 300 kilobases of chromosome difference and over 1,600 single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. So actually quite a significant difference between the two pathogens. If you look at the three isolates isolated in Britain, we found only three SNPs and a few changes in the plasmid content. And actually, you can see here the Indian isolate is actually quite different in its plasmid content compared to the European strains. So if we think about this geographically, what we think we've got is the Indian isolate over here, and then we've got these three British isolates over here, one isolated in southern England and two in northern Scotland. We have very few differences here, um, but quite a large difference between these guys. Whether this could have evolved or mutated or, or adapted, whatever way you want to think about it, to form these guys is another question. But based on the number of SNPs and, and the change in the DNA, we feel that there's probably a common ancestor which has diverged outwards to these guys here. If we look at the gene complement, we find that actually there's quite a few differences. Obviously, there's 300 KB of DNA different. But in the Indian isolate, we see a different complement of effectors that go through the type 3 system we mentioned earlier. It has these four, whereas the European isolate doesn't. The European isolate has a system for sucrose uptake. The Indian isolate doesn't have that. Sucrose uptake and metabolism. Then we have a common set of genes. And there's some really interesting ones in here. We have the type 3 secretion system, which we predicted. That's present. And I'll show you in a moment it's almost certainly active. We found, very unusually for a Pseudomonas, a set of genes that make a siderophore called Enterobactin. This, is only, this has never been found in Pseudomonas before. It's only found in Enterobacteria. It's a very, very strong chelator of iron. We also have a number of genes involved in what we predict are involved in uh, lignin breakdown. So lignin produced by plants, these trees, um, and it's possibly part of the, the kind of... Um, strategy for infection. One of the things that we have done, it's only a very simple test, is to look at this, excuse me, this correlation of um, sucrose uptake and metabolism. So the Indian isolate, remember I told you, causes infection in the leaves. The European isolate causes infection in the branches and the trunk. 
When we look at the pathology, Sarah, Sarah Green has shown that this guy only lives in the phloem of the tree. This one resides only in the leaves. The phloem carries much of the sucrose that is produced in the leaves and then it's translocated throughout the plant. Okay, so that's one of the main energy sources. So you can therefore see a likely correlation between the gene content and the pathology. If it's going to live inside the phloem, then probably sucrose is going to be important for growth. So a very simple test we did was just to take the European strain and the Indian strain, and we grew them in a very simple growth medium um, with no carbon source, and you see a flat line, no growth at all. This is showing you time over hours and optical density. As that goes up, so does back that's showing you an increase in bacterial numbers. We put the two strains into um, sucrose, the minimal medium with sucrose, and we can see the European strain is very, very happy to grow in that medium. The Indian strain can't, do, can't grow in it. So we have a very simple correlation showing you that sucrose is important and is probably a key factor of this European strain able to cause disease. Of course, we want to do more studies on pathogenicity, but as you can imagine, a tree is not exactly the most kind of um, easy thing to work on, as uh, Federico has discovered. Um, so Federico Durati has actually been in Vic's lab for a, a period. Um, he's now a PhD student with me. He's in his third year. Um, we had recently some um, horse chestnut trees cut down for um, some building work, and I got a piece of it here. Uh, so I've taken it home for my fire. Um, but it's, um, as you can see, that's a mature 25, 30-year-old tree. It's a bit too big to work on. So what he's been doing is looking at alternative plants to work with. And one of the plants we've come across is Nicotiana benthamiana. It's very commonly used in science research. Obviously, it's easy to grow, it's cheap, and it's um, um, very easy to work with as compared to the tree itself. We can use saplings. This is a, about a three-year-old sapling here. And we basically just use it for very simple um, uh, symptom tests. So these here are areas of the branch that we've inoculated on the tree with different isolates of the Pseudomastringi esculi, and you can see this kind of necrotic lesion building up. You don't get in the control. <coughs> Using Nicotiana is much easier. Um, we can inoculate into the leaves. And um, we can see that all of these strains um, cause um, tissue collapse in the leaves. And actually, when we first looked at this, we thought this was a resistant reaction. It looks very similar to the hypersensitive reaction. But what we did was um, tested the growth of the bacteria, and this is just using this strain here um, and comparing it to a tobacco pathogen, which we know grows in this plant. And you can see over time, although it's a little bit slower to take off, after 14 days, they've grown to pretty much equal levels. So we know, know now that the Nicotiana is quite a nice model to work with. In the genome sequence, we discovered um, that the pathogen carries a gene called um, HOPAB1, makes this effector protein. And this is one of these proteins that's secreted through the type 3 system. And from previous work of mine, we know that in the bean system and Sebastinoi and glycinia, that this is a very important factor for disease. So we looked at this um, gene and we knocked it out in the uh, in the Esculi pathogen, and we found remarkably that if we knock it out, compared to the wild type, we see loss of pathogenicity in the Cochiana and um, a, a reduced virulence, at least, in the horse chestnut. So it would appear to be important for um, the plant-pathogen interaction. When we look at the relatedness of um, this protein, we actually find that it's almost identical to the Sevastinoi gene. Um, and when we look at the amino acid sequence, we only found two amino acids that were different between the Eskili pathogens here and the Sevastinoi olive pathogen here. And Federico has just mutated these to see if they're uh, important for uh, this disease phenotype. When we take this result here, we get no response. This is what we would typically call a null response, but it's actually what we think is probably basal resistance. 
So we've looked at this, and basically, if you take the, the wild type here, you can see over time that you get this kind of response. With the knockout mutant, you get very little going on. This is probably just kind of damage from the inoculated area. But you can see there's very little response, particularly at day three. And if we put the gene back in, we restore that virulence phenotype. And so what we think is going on here is probably a basal resistance response. And one of the things we can test to kind of see if that's true is to look at whether one of the markers of basal resistance, or PTI, is actually triggered, and that is callose deposition. So we can do a stain to look for callose deposition. And this is basically just showing you leaf tissue inoculated with these different bacteria, and then you get callose deposited within the leaf tissue. And you can count these over different areas of the plant leaf and then quantify it. And we can see down here the amount of callos deposited for the different strains. I'll just put the arrows for the ones that are important for this slide. Here's the wild type. You get very little callos. You knock the gene out. You get an increase in callos deposition. And you, you complement it and you knock it back down again. So what we're saying here is, is that this Eskily gene here this particular effector is very important for the pathogen to overcome basal resistance. Okay? And if you can imagine, if you have, as I said at the beginning, you've got a non-pathogen, if you can suppress basal resistance, then you have the opportunity to infect this um, potentially new host. And that's one way that this might have occurred. As um, the Eskily strains, which have probably been just living in the environment, um, in Europe, not as a pathogen perhaps, as it perhaps gains this effector, that's been enough for it to kind of tip the balance and infect the tree. So just to summarise this section, we've seen a, um, that um, the Pseudomonas syringiescule strains rely on this major type 3 effector for pathogenicity and then it's probably involved in suppressing basal resistance. And so this could be one of the things we need to look at in terms of um, understanding the disease process a bit more. Okay, on to the final section now. So I alluded earlier about how I'm interested in not only the interaction with the plant, but what happens to pathogens away from the plant. And Federico has been doing some work on this as part of his PhD. Of course, there's many ways in which you can look at a plant pathogen outside of the plant host. Um, one of the things we've looked at in particular is whether Pseudomonas syringes can survive um, the interaction with uh, predatory organisms. So can Pseudomonas survive in the environment? And one of the reasons why this could be important is because if it can survive those predation mechanisms, then potentially those mechanisms might explain how the pathogen has spread so rapidly through um, Europe and the UK. So one of the first things we've done is um, looked at what happens when you um, challenge Pseudomonas syringi um, pathogens with um, this nematode, Cynorhabditis elegans. And on this graph here, we're looking at whether um, any of the syringes are toxic to the nematode. So this is showing you um, nematode death, and the different strains here. And on this, so I'm going to talk now about not only the horse chestnut pathogen, but also a bean pathogen and a tomato pathogen. We've tried to do it um, to kind of get a nice broad overview. And then as a control, E. coli OP50 is what we use nematodes, that, uh, is their standard feeding bacterium. So that's the control there. And what we see is a very weak toxic effect. So it's not having a major effect, but it, it has a weak toxicity. The kind of key experiment, of course, though, is um, what does the nematode do to the pathogen? What effect does it have there? So here we're looking at bacterial cell numbers over seven days. And we've got the four strains again, and they're all at quite high numbers to start with. And the nematode does reduce the bacterial numbers. But there's two things here. First of all, we know that these numbers tend to stabilize over time. So they come up with a way of stopping them, completely killing them off. But the other thing is here, you can see that between E. coli and Pseudomonas, there's a big, big difference in terms of the drop in numbers. So what that suggests to us is that Pseudomonas does have 
some kind of mechanism to kind of help it survive this predation. So it's able to cope with nematode grazing. Another system we've looked at is the interaction of pseudomonas with amoeba, which are predatory protozoa. In this case, Acanthamoeba polyphaga. And when we challenge um, amoeba with the four strains, this is no bacteria in blue, looking at the number of amoeba cells, over time, we find that amoeba only grow on the E. coli strain. They don't grow, so they don't increase their numbers on the pseudomonas. So it's a slightly different assay. It's a little bit more tricky to work with the system. And it's, um, you know, we're still trying to work out if we can see amoeba cell death. But what this would suggest is that pseudomonas prevents the amoeba from wiping out its population and it's able to kind of survive that amoeba grazing. Looking at um, the number of um, the effect of the amoeba on the, on the bacterial numbers, so here we've seen amoeba growth on E. coli but no growth on the pseudomonas. The amoeba, looking at the number of bacteria on this axis here, the amoeba do once again reduce bacterial cell numbers over time. But just as we saw with the nematodes, this basically stabilizes um, to um, levels which are much, much better than E. coli, showing us that uh, although amoeba will reduce pseudomonas numbers, pseudomonas over time comes up with strategies to avoid complete wipeout, unlike E. coli. So P. syringa is able to cope with amoeba predation. The last thing we're interested in is, and this is particularly interesting for thinking about spread of um, pathogens in the environment, is interaction with insects. So we've done some work now with aphids, but I'm not going to show you that now because it's, it's fairly new and it, there's not much to kind of talk about. But most of the work we've done is with this kind of model insect, Galeria melanella, which is basically a wa wax moth. And we use larvae, and we basically inject bacterial cells into um, the, hemos uh, the, the hemocele of the larvae. And um, if the bacteria are toxic to the larvae, then they'll kill them. So you see effects like um, you get melanization effects, which is basically the insect immune response kicking in. Um, you can see some healthy ones here. Um, and then basically, if we stimulate their head and there's no movement, then that's it. They've copped it, they're dead. Um, so we can see basically, if you look at E. coli, absolutely no effect at all. Um, whereas the Pseudomonas syringes up here do, in fact, um, have toxic effects. And we can quantify that over a period of time. You can see nothing with E. coli after 72 hours, whereas up to 100% of um, the larvae are killed with um, the three different pseudomonas. So we conclude from that that Sumus syringi is in fact toxic to invertebrates as well. And one of the things we've also discovered just through chance was that the supernatant of these pseudomonas also has a toxicity effect. So if we take away the cells, Filter, filter the supernatant, inject that into the larvae, then we actually find toxic effects there. So something that it's secreting or, or producing on the outside of its cell is actually having a toxic effect on these. So how does Pseudomonas do this? How, how is it able to survive these interactions? We've used a, a genetic screening technique to identify the genes that are present in Pseudomonas that are helping it to survive. And this is called rapid virulence annotation. And RVA was developed by a friend and colleague in the University of Bath, um, used, and he used it to identify virulence factors for an insect pathogen. And the way it works is basically on the basis of this. We take the Pseudomonas genome, chop it into pieces, and clone those pieces into a particular cloning vector. We then transfer them into E. coli, and then we have the e co what we call a, an E. coli genomic library. Okay. We know that E. coli is completely wiped out by all of the three organisms, you know, their immune systems or they're eaten, whereas Pseudomonas doesn't. So if the Pseudomonas genes that are present in the E. coli confer some protective mechanism, then in a genetic screen, we should be able to find those. So what we do is we take 
the Cosmid Library and we challenge the Cosmids with nematodes and we look for gain of toxicity, nematode gain of toxicity. So here we can see nematodes spotted here and you have a Cosmid clone here. In this case, the Cosmid, the E. coli is completely eaten. In this case, the E. coli is expressing some pseudomonas gene that's helping it survive. The same with the amoeba. And in terms of here, we're just looking at toxicity effects in the insect. Federico has now screened three different genomic libraries, um, 1,800 clones uh, for this strain, 2,000 clones for each of these. And what we did was we put them through the three systems. You can see here the kind of summary of the outcomes. So we found quite a lot of um, cosmins in all of them. And then what we do is we take, we then extract the plasmid DNA in the E. coli, we end sequence what's, uh, what the insert is, and then we then take that end sequence and map it back onto the chromosome for each of these bacteria. So for the insect gain of toxicity, we have areas of the chromosome here, also for the amoeba, and also for the nematodes. In this way, we can find common regions that might be involved. This might be one locus, for example, here another one. And we also find potentially novel regions, here being one. OK, so from that, we've discovered a bunch of genes. And um, we can try and predict what's in there. So you've got to remember that the insert of each of these clones is about between 20 and 40 kilobases. So you can have a lot of different genes. And these are obviously just predictions um, based on what's in there. We know, for example, in one cosmid, we had the entire um, um, operon for the flagellum biosynthesis um, of Pseudomonas. Um, or, well, it's actually spread over many areas in the chromosome, but we had one of the main areas um, in one cosmid. We found, and I was quite pleased about this, a region of <coughs> the tomato pathogen carrying insecticidal toxins. Um, we have um, this system here, type 6 secretion system. We've done a lot of work on this now um, in collaboration with um, Mina Pihonen in, in um, Finland and Nai Chun Lin in Taiwan. So we're, all three of us are working on this system um, to try and work out its importance in interactions with uh, insects and nematodes. We have also here quorum sensing. Don't ask me what they are, though, Vic, because I can't remember. Um, but um, we can find out later on my computer if you want. Um, and then we also have um, this kind of um, little box in the middle, which is kind of basically um, the, the kind of common genes. So motility and chemotaxis and ABC transporters seem to be a common theme. Um, from there, and this is coming up to the end of the, the kind of talk now, is the next kind of step. And that's really to try and validate um, what we've found. Um, what are the genes that we've found? Are they important? Um, the, the best way to do that, of course, is to go back to Pseudomonas. So what we've been doing is making knockouts of selected genes. And, he, and um, Federico chose uh, 10 genes. He's managed so far to make knockouts in eight. So we make knockouts in the Pseudomonas. We then re-challenge the mutants to the nematodes, insects, etc., and amoeba. And we look at what the outcome is in terms of um, survival or toxicity. And this is just an example from the insect gain of toxicity. So we're looking at insect to toxicity here and a variety of different strains. This is the wild type Pseudomonas. And then these are mutants here. We can see in some cases we get small but statistically significant reduction in um, toxicity. In other cases, increased toxicity. And a really interesting theme that's come out, and we only discovered this the other day, is that this particular um, gene here is known as an RHS gene. And there's one paper that's come out not long ago which implicated these in overproducing or, or regulating the production of extracellular polysaccharides, the polysaccharide on the outside of the cells. So we, when we looked at that, we thought, well, OK, we actually have an alginate mutant of this DC3000 strain in the freezer. And when we took that alginate mutant, the ALG-D mutant here, whoa, completely gone. Yeah, no toxicity at all. 
So what we think is happening is that the RHS gene is probably involved in regulating expression of ALS-D. Something we have to test, obviously. Um, so the ALS-D mutant is quite convincing that that's important. And we wonder if this gene here, PIL-J, might also be involved in regulating that. Another piece of evidence was with this mutant here, FLEQ. This is the master regulator for making the flagellum. And we know from work that we've done previously that if you knock out this gene, it basically controls the, the flagellum. So if you knock it out, you get no flagellum biosynthesis. But when you knock it out, you actually get upregulation of EPS. If you think about that in terms of, if you think about how a bacterium forms a biofilm, if you kind of think about a community, it doesn't want to swim away from the biofilm, so it shuts that down, and it starts producing lots of polysaccharide to make a matrix for the bacteria to live in. So we've got here, knockout of flea Q increases toxicity compared to the wild type. So we're, we're thinking that EPS is probably quite an important part of um, the survival strategy of the bacteria when it interacts with these organisms. So we've looked at the bacteria and the challenges that it's had to face in its lifestyle. We've looked at how it has to overcome recognition of some of these um, molecules here, how it de it's developed this pathogenicity system here to try and suppress recognition of these molecules. And we come back to this stuff here on the outside, the extracellular polysaccharide, seems to play a key role in protecting the bacterium in other potential hosts. So just to summarise all that, we've seen pseudomonas have evolved various different strategies, toxins, EPS, um, and motility we think is also a key kind of one. We think that basically one of the strategies is, hey, big guy, run away. So that's one of the things we think is going on. We've seen swarming kick, uh, kicking off with some of these guys. Um, so there's several systems involved. So we have a redundant kind of phenotype, as it were, um, knocking out some of these. Sometimes you see no effect. Um, in other, other cases, we do. We see insecticidal toxins being produced. We see type 6 secretion also being involved. And then EPS appears to be very important. So the overall summary for the talk really is that when we consider the greater um, environment, plant pathogens have a lot to cope with, and they come up with a lot of different strategies to do that. Um, and we've seen various aspects of that throughout the talk. Using genetics and genomics hand in hand has been brilliant for kind of understanding some of these systems. And we can see quite nice correlations between the genetic um, components of the pathogen and the pathology that we see on the, the plants. Can we use it to treat it is obviously a key question. So one of the, the projects I've got coming up soon is to actually develop, um, uh, to try and develop phages, um, so viruses that infect this pathogen, and then look at potential use of the phage in phage therapy. And we know that we've already found phages within um, the pathogen itself, so we can be guaranteed that we're going to get some phages coming out. Um, and then it's, it's going to be useful for understanding how the phage impacts with the bacterium. We've seen that the tree pathogen and other pseudomonas can cope with predation pressure, so they almost certainly can survive outside of the plant for some time. Okay, so that means that you've always got this kind of pool flying around, and then you've all got the impacts that they have on the bacteria, and then they have to adapt to that. And it's going to be driving evolution of those bacteria to an extent so that um, eventually a new pathogen type might emerge to infect a new plant. And then we're looking also <coughs> at this aspect here. This toxicity to insects, it's not instantaneous toxicity. If you get eaten by a caterpillar eating tissue infected with a bacterium, then it goes into the the insect, well, hey, in some insects, you know, they might just digest them. In others, though, the bacteria potentially will express its toxins, and in that time, the insect's moved on, maybe to a different part of the plant, maybe to different plants. It gets killed, and then the bacteria can emerge, and from there, they've spread. 
Just my acknowledgements um, in my lab. Uh, Federico's done most of this work. We've got a couple of other students at the moment and several others starting later in the year. I've omitted Glyn Percival, who I, I've been working with also, particularly providing trees. Um, my wife, Dawn, who works in this uni. Um, and then David and Sarah were both um, heavily involved. They both did the genome sequencing, effectively. And Nick and Maria in Bath, both are very good friends and colleagues. Um, we've published the genome sequence, just came out um, a few weeks ago in PLOS One. And I'd just like to take this opportunity again to thank you very much for the invitation here and, and for your time today. And I hope it was a, an interesting kind of aspect. Okay, thanks.